I hit the uh, I hit the recording. It's going. Okay, excellent. All right, welcome everybody to the Smoky Mountain Computational Science and Engineering's Data Challenge for 2020. This data challenge is part of a much bigger conference, the Smoky Mountain Computational Science and Engineering Conference, which is Oak Ridge National Laboratory's primary planning conference, where they look at the most cutting edge topics in high performance computing, uh, data analytics, machine learning, and AI. So we're just a small part of that. Uh, if you succeed in winning at the data challenge, you will be invited either virtually or in person, depending on what the conditions are like in the world at the time, to that conference in August. And if you have a winning paper, you will also be given an opportunity to publish that paper in a Springer Linker journal that is associated with the conference. So those are the main incentives. I'm going to cover very quickly uh, what we need to do to register, just sort of to buy time so more of us can join because I can see the number still ticking up. So if you are interested in this challenge, the first place you want, you want to go is smc-datachallenge.ornl.gov. And the first thing you wanna check out is the challenges. So I have highlighted that tab. If I click on that tab, it gives me a list of the challenges that I can click on. And if I click on each one, and in, later in the presentation, each of the data Please mute your mic. Okay, so each of the challenges uh, is going to have an introduction that describes why the data is important and what scientific uh, ideas it's directly selecting. Uh, there'll be information about what the data sets contain, and then there will be the challenge questions. These are the analytic challenges that are you being asked to solve. Uh, and then, of course, there's a few notes. In the left-hand corner, I'm sorry, the right-hand corner of each challenge, you will have the ability to download the data set. On three of them, it's just click a button and it will download. A couple of the data sets are in the three gigabyte range, so you may have to wait a while. There's also a PDF that has all of this information on it if you download that. Uh, so, just to go and register. And we need you to register by June 22nd, so we know who's coming. Registration is simple. It's the team lead or the person that's going to be the point of contacts, first name, last name, and email. Uh, and you'll have a little bit more information to fill out there. Importantly, fill out the challenge that you want to take. That's why you have to look at them first. Now, we allow you to register for more than one challenge. And if you need to change what challenge you're registered for, you're absolutely welcome to do that. Uh, then you want to choose your challenge category. Uh, student or novice, this is any kind of student, be you high school, college, uh, graduate school, or somebody that is perhaps like a doctor or scientist that doesn't do data analytics. I don't know if there's any of us out there that don't do data analytics, but if you're just getting into machine learning or something and you are already a PhD, you can choose novice if it's not something that you've done before. Advanced uh, is for somebody that does data analytics as a career. So basically, if you are a functioning scientist, you probably are going to be in the advanced category. A mixed team will take, will take the highest level. So if your team has students and advanced people, you'll compete as advanced. Uh, and so next, we want your team's emails. And that's because if we do another event like this or an AMA, uh, we will send invitations to everybody on the team. Then you click submit. It's fine, like I said, if you need to change that registration later. Okay, once that's done uh, and you've solved your challenge, you've worked, you gotta solve these by July 27th. And on July 27th, you need to submit a six to eight page paper that describes your solution. Um, these papers are the ones that will be the seed of what you publish, you win the challenge. Uh, paper submission guidelines are here. There's Springer's guidelines for how they want it formatted, it formatted and what templates. Also, this is a little bit redundant with our registration. You'll have to find Easy Chair and go to the conference website. So I'm trying to do that now. You'll log in. You're not going to have as many options because I've set up this conference site, but uh, you'll have author and you'll click author and hopefully you'll see the screen that comes up next. So this is the second thing that you have to do once you complete, complete the paper. And if you're really serious about fin finishing this, I would do this now because you can constantly update this site with your team members or with your paper. So basically it asks you the same kind of information as the registration, and then it has a, a blank for uploading your paper. Uh, and like I said, you can update this site as many times as you need until 5 p.m. on July 27th. So go ahead. 
Call for papers. How will your papers be judged? Well, we have a huge committee uh, of people from Oak Ridge National Lab, many of the national labs, in fact, and other research institutions that will peer review your your submissions. Selections will be um, will be uh, notified by August seventh, and at that time, depending on what format the conference is running in, you'll either be asked to do a poster and a video, or perhaps just a lightning talk video. It depends on where we're at. Uh, your presentations, there'll be a day that you get invited to if you went, if you are selected at that point between August 25th and 27th. If we are in person and you are someplace far away, we're going to have you work with somebody that's actually in Tennessee so that that person can go and present the poster in your absence and maybe do that with a combination of video. And then camera ready date would be September 15th. So those are all the really important dates. Um, and things you need to know. I want to go back and show you one thing on the challenges. I showed you the download one. There's another method uh, that we're serving the data this year, and that's through our DOI service. Several of these sets have a DOI. And this is what the DOI landing page looks like. So you would go click download. In order to do this, you need to have Globus Connect Personal set up on your receiving computer. And there are videos that show you how to set up a Globus endpoint on your computer and how to download the instructions from that DOI site. So the first three challenges have that. The latter challenges have the click button and the Kaggle challenge will be whatever Kaggle is serving. All right, I'm Suzanne peretti Kuhn. I'm very excited to see you all here. And I'm going to turn this presentation over to Pete Peterson, uh, who is our challenge one data scientist or data sponsor and a scientist at the Spallation Neutron Source. So, hello, as Suzanne said, my name is Peter Peterson, and I'm here to talk to you about data challenge 1. Suzanne already showed a little bit about. The DOI for you to download, uh, and you can also use that as a reference in your paper. So, uh, this is a data set that is taken from the Vulcan diffractometer at the Spallation neutron source. The Vulcan diffractometer is used for studying engineering materials. So this is how they behave during uh, processing, operation, and how they're made. One classic, to, and because of this, most of what they do is what is known as in situ measurements. Uh, a particular style that's being shown here in this particular challenge is a pump probe measurement, where what they did is they measured, uh, they brought the temperature of a material up to a, a high point around 800 C and then let it cool naturally to ambient temperatures and then they heat it again and cycle that many, many times. So the data set challenge we have for you to look at is trying to understand when that data is actually more when the uh, temperature of the sample was being increased and decreased. So there's actually two sample temperatures in here. We are only showing one in this, this image uh, where it's heated rapidly and falls on. So what the challenge is, is trying to explore uh, when these cycles are going on, how long it takes for it to decay, and then clustering these into different amounts. So with the neutron measurement, they don't normally have enough neutrons counted in individual pump probe so they'll repeat it many times. Your challenge is to find out when those heat cycles are happening and identify them and give information as to how that uh, can be used later on in, in understanding the final data. Now, pass it back to Suzanne. Okay, we will move on to our next challenge. Uh, are there any questions for Pete? If not, we can hold those to the end. Also, there is going to be an AMA that's actually live now that you can post picture questions for any of these challenges. So I'm going on to challenge two, I believe, Junji Yin, the scientist uh, who's presenting for that challenge. Uh, Junji. Okay. Hi. Um, so my name is Jun Ji. I'm from Advanced Data and the Workflow Group of, of uh, Oak Ridge Leadership Computing Facility. And uh, this challenge uh, is actually a long standing problem uh, in atomic computing. Actually, uh, 
of the question is, can you learn the structure of the per, uh, of a particular material from its microscopic image? Um, so it's an open problem. It's a long-standing inverse problem, and the, the data set actually is a result of a uh, inside project. Inside project is a DOE computing project. Um, this data set uh, contains actually over the microscopic images from over 60,000 materials, solid state materials. And uh, we have it labeled uh, such as um, crystal group, lattice uh, constant angles, uh, chemical compositions, etc. So it, the, each individual samples, uh, it's basically a microscopic pattern that uh, is a 2D array, 512 by 512, and we do the projection from three different angles and stack them together. So overall, it's 512 by 512 by three. You can consider it if you're playing with image net, you can consider it as an image net for material or uh, microscopic images, because uh, the task we ask is, so from given these microscopic uh, pattern images, can you reversely learn what's the structure? For example, what's the uh, crystal space group this material belongs to? So it's, uh, it can be a classification problem, just like ImageNet, you classify 1,000 cards. It, it also has a regression component because it also has like a lattice constant or lattice angle, which you can learn. So you can combine your uh, classification with the regression to have a multitask learning. So it's a rich data set. You can play with your a different uh, deep learning, machine learning techniques. One thing I want to mention is that because it contains uh, a quite a lot of materials, the data size is actually over 500 gigabytes. So you may need some horsepower to do the data engineering or data processing. Uh, you may prefer to use some parallel techniques to process them in parallel. Um, uh, but uh, as I mentioned, uh, as listed in the document, the first uh, question actually is just a typical uh, data EDA, data engineering test to help you understand the challenge. Because uh, as you can imagine, not, uh, not all the material, the space group is not uniform distributed among uh, nature materials. And uh, actually, it's quite imbalanced, which is a big issue. First issue is how to deal with the quite unbalanced data in your learning process. I think I have more covered. Uh, Susan? Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jinji. Try to think of your questions and post them on the AMA. We're going to go to challenge three. Uh, this is the impacts of urban weather. And I believe that Anne Barris is giving this challenge description. I need to put up your PowerPoint, so I will do that. Should be sharing a PowerPoint here. I'm not seeing it yet. Okay. How about now? Yes. Ah, all right. Hi, all. I'm in. Uh, I'm actually going to present two different challenges. Um, Melissa asked me to fill in because she's unavailable right now. Um, so, this first one. Um, we are very interested in looking at our microclimate and how it interacts with building energy. Uh, so uh, in a city, you have a lot of uh, wind, you have temperatures bouncing off of buildings and all that. Uh, so you have 
and you, then you get different kinds of radiation. So direct normal radiation is, is for example, sunlight that directly hits a building, whereas diffuse radiation gets diffused by clouds that are in between the sun and the buildings that we're looking at. So this data here that we're providing is for the Chicago Loop. So this, uh, the little blue blobs are all buildings in that area. And then what you see in the background, those reds and yellows and oranges uh, are climate data. So if you can switch to the next slide, please. Um, so uh, the data set contains weather files for a full year at 15 minute intervals. Uh, so that is simulated weather data. If I'm not mistaken, it's from WARF. It's a climate simulation. Um, that we have the building geometry uh, or at least the building location. Yeah, no, like it's, well, it's, it's a 2D geometry plus height. Uh, so it's not quite a 3D building, but pretty close. Um, so you know where the buildings are, how tall they are, uh, what they look, roughly look like. And then we also provide the building energy use output from Energy Plus, which is, uh, the, I think, more or less state-of-the-art building energy uh, simulation. Uh, and then next slide. Uh, so basically, so the questions that we're interested in are, uh, do you see any interesting variations and co uh, correlations between weather changes and building energy use in this area? Uh, which types of buildings are more sensitive to weather changes like temperature, humidity, and so on and so forth? Um, can you come up with any interesting visualizations? For this, um, the scale of the climate data and the building data is quite different. Uh, I've played around with it a little bit in the past. Um, and then, uh, like, how, how do you divide it into more meaningful subsets? Uh, how does build, uh, energy use change throughout the year? Um, and then uh, something that's particularly interesting is looking at the hottest and the coldest months. Uh, just because that's when you have the most air conditioning or the most heating being used. Um, if you remember what a half years ago or so, uh, Chicago got minus 40 in winter. Uh, I don't think 2015 was quite as cold, but um, that's definitely very different from summer times when I think they get pretty normal temperatures up there. Um, yeah, so that's this challenge. And then I'm also presenting another challenge that is also looking at Chicago, but under a completely different um, lens. So if, if we can switch to that one. So uh, this challenge is more about the, um, the connection between different parts of that urban ecosystem. So we're interested in human mobility driven um, changes in that ecosystem. So say at like, in the normal world, not right now, usually you would get up in the morning, maybe take a kid to uh, walk your kid to the school bus, and then get in the car, drive to work, maybe walk or drive to lunch from there. Then on your way home, you might stop at a gym and a grocery store. Right now, we don't do that, but usually we would. Um, so uh, wherever you are, you're going to use energy uh, and uh, your moving through the city will affect the climate, it will affect emissions, uh, it will affect energy use, uh, whether it's in the car or in a building. So uh, if you can switch to the next slide, um, we're providing a pretty large uh, conglomeration of data. So we have vehicle data that is simulated using transims. So that's basically vehicle traces uh, containing the location of each vehicle at 30 second intervals. Then we have a cut down version of national household travel survey data that give you all kinds of interesting information about uh, why people take certain trips during certain times of day. Um, we have vehicle type distribution from the Federal Highway Association for Chicago. Um, and that's more or less derived from, the, from that uh, national household travel survey data set. And we have emissions data that was simulated using moves based on the outputs of the transportation simulation that we did prior. And so that all matches with the road network that was used for both of those uh, simulations. 
and we've building data. Those are just the building footprints. So Microsoft has all buildings in the US uh, and is providing some data for that. So we have cut that down to a manageable size because the full size data set is not manageable on most computers. Uh, like even just cutting it down was not particularly fun on a laptop. Um, we have land use data. Uh, basically, that's like which parcel of land is uh, being used for what. So that may be interesting to look at uh, to figure out where people might be going. If say they're going shopping, they're not going to go shopping in a residential area. They're going to go shopping in a, a commercial area. So you can find some information about that in, the, in that uh, land use data. We have also have some socioeconomic data from census and also from that uh, from that CMAP, which is specifically for Chicago, which has a little bit more information on uh, employment, including what type of employment it is, uh, travel choice, mo uh, travel mode choice. So are people taking a bus? Are they taking a car? Are they taking? Are they walking? Things like that. Different housing types, things like that. And then so questions that we're asking. And that's the last slide. Um, and before we go there, um, what are the sizes of your data sets for three and four? Um, I think three was large enough that we needed a DOI. I, I don't actually know off the top of my head. Um, I think it was around uh, three or four gigabytes for three, and I'm not sure for four. Yeah, I can I can look that up. Um, I think I still have like it was small enough to keep around my Dropbox, uh, but large enough that I wouldn't attach it to an email. Um, so somewhere in a couple of gigabytes range, I would assume. Let me see. Do I have the something I want to point out is we do have these data sets, both the DOI ones and the regular ones, broken up so you can download individual pieces to get started working. Uh, I don't think any of these challenges do you have to download the whole data set to get started. Yeah, so the data is provided in a zip archive and in a zip archive, it's pretty small. So we have, so that snapshot with the vehicle traces is pretty big and a little more difficult to handle. So we have a version with a short snapshot uh, and then we have a bigger snapshot uh, that you can use for the full work. Uh, but if you just want to get your, um, your algorithms going, uh, you could just use a short snapshot for that. But yeah, so it's actually in the megabyte range. So uh, with the full snapshot, the zip file is under the gigabytes, like 600 something megabytes. Not too bad. If it's bigger. Um, I, I can see if my computer tells me that. Yeah, it's about uh, two and a half gigs unzipped. A lot of it is tabular, so it zips very well. So we can offer you support too uh, in how to's if people are having trouble downloading any of these sets. There's several of us working that will at least help you troubleshoot if you can't get the sets downloaded. Okay, thanks. Go on. Sorry. So for questions, so basically uh, one of the things uh, we're very interested in is figuring out which people are going to which buildings, and we've done an initial pro initial approach you know, using. A Quad tree, uh, and that is published. If you can't find it or if you can't access it, just send me an email. I can share a PDF with you. Um, and then uh, basically, so that algorithm that you're using should be efficient and accurate. There is a certain trade off in that. Uh, so if you use a quad tree and uh, it goes down too far, you're going to miss some buildings that might be nearby. So definitely consider that. Um, you will run into some efficiency issues uh, if you're not making it or like you're you're going to run into time issues if you're not making it efficient because it's a lot of buildings and it's a lot of vehicles and it, it takes a while uh, if you aren't smart about it so uh that is definitely something to think about it's definitely an algorithmic challenge we're also interested in uh correlations between emissions uh we have some climate data that i think i didn't list um so we can provide the data in the data set you have to download it yourself but we have instructions on that um uh, but basically look at the correlations between emissions and some of the data in the other data sets uh, we're also interested in traffic patterns uh 
which roads are most popular, what are the hotspots, is there congestions, what are travel times, uh, how do they vary during, throughout the day, uh, how do, do speeds vary spatially and temporally. Um, also, I mean that the data is simulated, so uh, I expect you're going to see some some things that let you conclude how the simulation was set up. So, you know, you can try to reverse engineer that. Um, I found that to be somewhat fun. Um, but yeah, and then basically, so for every folder in the zip file, we also have a readme that has a little bit more information about each data set in that folder. Um, but yeah, if you have any extra questions that are not answered by that, uh, just like go on the Reddit AMA or uh, once the AMA is over, uh, just shoot me an email. Okay, thank you, Dr. Barris. Uh, do you think that they have to solve all of these in order to win, win a challenge or if they just make progress, can they still win? Yeah, just like make some progress. It's, it's really more of a, I, I think part one, is definitely uh, absolutely sufficient as a standalone. It, 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 it was a big enough challenge to get a paper out of it. So um, you, you, you can probably get another paper out of it. Um, and then uh, the other two you can probably do in tandem or you can look them separately. Um, I would say it mostly depends on, you know, uh, the, the amount of result that you have, uh, but you can probably uh, on any of those three have a submission and, uh, you know, have a good chance at winning, depending on what you did. And this is true for all of our challenges, by the way, the challenges uh, are meant to be increasing in difficulty as you answer more questions. So past year's winners have not always answered all of the questions on any challenge, but the more that you answer, the better chance that you have if you're competing. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Ann Barris, and I'm going to move now to challenge five. Challenge five uh, is the challenge from British Petroleum using machine learning to understand uncertainties for subsurface exploration. And I believe Dr. Max Grossman, are you our speaker for this challenge? That's right. Excellent, take it away. Great, thank you. So, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Max Grossman. I'm a consultant data scientist at BP. Really excited to be here for the, the second year in a row taking part in the, uh, the Oak Ridge Smoky Mountain Data Challenge. Um, at a really uncertainty in what structures of interest look like in the subsurface um, versus where we're kind of just guessing and, and there's a lot of uncertainty of our subsurface structures. I'll give a quick background and then explain more about what our data set contains. So to, the first concept you need to understand is what a seismic survey is. So a seismic survey is on a gram where we're shooting sound waves into the subsurface using what you can kind of think of as really large speakers, boom boxes, um, and then measuring the reverberations, the reflections, the refractions of those sound waves um, coming off of planes and faults and other objects of interest under the ground um, using what are called receivers. After you collect a seismic survey, you basically get, you know, what you can think of as just a bunch of audio files recorded at each of these receivers based on what we're sending out from the sources. Um, with that data set, we run that through what's called seismic processing, which is basically just a massive data workflow where we're trying to recover a seismic volume based on what we've imaged in the subsurface. So a seismic volume is essentially just a 3D volume where we're trying to estimate the density of each XYZ coronet um, in the subsurface so that we can start to get a feel for how things are, are oriented and organized um, inside the Earth. After that, we go through what's called seismic interpretation, which is essentially um, handing that seismic volume over to um, experts like geologists and geophysicists to understand where actual features of interest, so where are their faults, where are their planes in the subsurface, where are their salt structures, um, where are maybe some reservoirs of interest, like holding um, oil or natural gas. Um, and at the end, we get an interpreted, you know, one example realization of, of what our subsurface might look like and might guide um, future drilling projects. So this is clearly a really massive data workflow. 
And unfortunately, a lot of uncertainty can creep in. So you have measurement uncertainty, your receivers aren't perfect. There's probably a lot of environmental noise that you have to account for. Um, there's human bias, you know, interpreters, if you hand the same size and volume to two different interpreters, they might pick the faults in a little bit differently. The horizons might turn out a little different. They might highlight seismic um, salt bodies a little bit differently. So there's a lot of uncertainty here. Um, so the focus of this challenge is to um, emphasize a very specific type of uncertainty, and that's in our velocity models of our seismic volume. So what is a velocity model? Um, really high level, a velocity model is basically a guess or an estimation based on our geological understanding of a certain region of Earth at how quickly these sound waves propagate through that region of the Earth. So it's basically based on what we know about the history of this of this region um, over you know millions and millions of years of deposition after deposition. Um, what do we think? How quickly do we think uh, sound waves are traveling through the Earth at any point in time? Um, this velocity model is key to a good seismic processing workflow and key to recovering an accurate seismic volume. But there's also a lot of uncertainty in the seismic volume because it is an estimation. Um, and if you ask two different geophysicists to generate the same seismic um, velocity model for the same seismic survey, you'll more often than not get two slightly different answers, both of which are, are equally probable and equally realistic. So this is an important source of uncertainty. Basically, what we've done with our data set is we've taken a artificial region of the Earth that's that's realistic. Um, we've generated a large number of possible velocity models, you know, realistic velocity models that you could actually get from a geophysicist. We've run them through a simple seismic processing workflow and then generate a bunch of possible realizations. So each of these realizations is entirely realistic. Um, it could actually represent what the truth is, um, but there's uncertainty here. We're not really sure which of our velocity model actually represents the ground truth. And, and realistically, none of them do. Um, so what we're interested in seeing is really how can we use all these different possibilities, all these different realizations of, um, of our seismic volume in order to understand where in our, um, our seismic region are we extremely uncertain and have a lot of uncertainty and we're really just guessing versus where do we have a lot of certainty and, and you know, small changes and tweaks to the velocity model don't really make much of a difference. So our data set includes a bunch of different realizations. There's both a, a smaller three gigabyte data set for folks who, who wanna work um, on their laptops, as well as a larger 50 gigabyte data set for people that, that want a little bit more data to play with. Um, we've provided some example code and example notebooks that people can use in order to get started. So you don't have to start from scratch and understand how to load things like um, seismic segwi files. And there's also a PDF with a challenge that includes both the challenge problem, um, but also a lot of hopefully helpful background information on seismic processing and seismic surveys in general. Um, and so, you know, really just at a high level, we're interested in, in any techniques, um, like basic statistical techniques, analytical techniques, all the way up to, you know, massive deep learning convolutional networks um, that can generate some kind of an uncertainty map, an uncertainty quantification, an uncertainty measurement, um, that tells us how certain or uncertain we are about different regions or different parts of our seismic volume. Um, and then there are a bunch of kind of incremental challenge questions and challenge problems that will help lead you towards that eventual um, kind of pie in the sky goal. Um, so again, really excited that we're taking part um, and, and we'll be happy, we'll be available on the Reddit AMA and happy to answer any questions that folks have um, about the data set, the data challenge, um, or, or, or any of the background knowledge that, that you might need to get up to speed. Thanks. Thanks so much, Max. If you guys download this PDF, a lot of the data that Max talked about is actually displayed. So this is a larger PDF on this challenge set. Uh, it has a lot of that background information that he was talking about so that you have it right there with you. Um, okay, thank you so much, Max. I think that was very helpful. Let's go to challenge six now. Um, this is artificial intelligence techniques to match patients with their best clinical trial options. And I believe uh, Iona Dansanu is the, Dr. Iona Dansanu is the spokesman. Iona, are you with us? I am. <clears throat> um, so our group here at the Oak Ridge National Laboratory um, focuses on biomedical research. And as such, one of the important problems that we have um, has to do with matching patients with clinical trials. 
So um, as some people might already know, um, getting a drug from research and development um, to actually um, it being FDA approved uh, for patient use is a pretty tedious process. Um, so after animal studies, what usually happens is that uh, uh, the drug has to go through like different phases of clinical trials. Um, and uh, it has to be actually uh, tested through the different uh, phases uh, on patients. But one of the problems um, is uh, the fact that uh, um, not enough patients are recruited for the clinical trials. Um, and so um, that makes a lot of research and development that was put into the drug um, take uh, much, much longer. And so it's uh, very time consuming and um, it involves using a lot of resources. Um, and then uh, on the other hand, uh, for patients that have uh, um, severe diseases such as cancer, uh, what happens is that they don't get access to the most novel uh, treatment options that are available for them. And so um, our challenge uh, focuses on using um, AI techniques um, to uh, match patients with clinical trials. So the reason why we need um, AI for this problem um, is uh, multifold. So first of all, one of the issues has to do with uh, unstructured text processing. So getting from um, uh, an inclusion criteria that says that the patient has to have um, these characteristics to actually getting the data in structured form um, is no easy task. The second um, issue has to do with uh, actually uh, matching the patients. And so creating um, some sort of formula that says that, for example, if the patient is within this geographical area um, of a uh, uh, trial site, and if it has you know, certain uh, parameters, certain diseases, et cetera, then they would be eligible. And making sure that uh, different weights are applied um, for the different criteria that um, patients might meet. And so um, the data sets that we're providing uh, are three in number. So the first one um, is a, a subset of eligibility criteria that has already been translated into a machine readable code. Um, the second uh, is a set of the identified patient records. Um, that uh, uh, can be uh, used to match to the appropriate clinical trials. And the third one um, is a set of annotated uh, physician um, uh, matches um, that was uh, created by our physician partners that basically say that, um, you know, this particular patient from uh, data set two is matched to these um, um, clinical trials from data set one. So some sort of a, uh, so data set three is a uh, gold standard of the matching paradigm, if you may. Um, and so uh, in terms of the data set, uh, in, in terms of the challenge questions, so we're interested in uh, data representation. Um, so looking at what kind of data structures would accommodate um, these matches. Um, so potential ideas are different types of databases, graphs, et cetera. Um, in terms of algorithm development, uh, we're interested in uh, uh, finding different um, AI solutions um, for uh, matching patients with the clinical trials. And then last but not least, we're also interested in uh, being able to visualize um, these matches. So uh, some sort of uh, uh, graphical like interface that ranks the criteria uh, for that may uh, patients eligible for clinical trials um, is, um, um, I guess, one of our questions. But uh, we are open uh, to any other problems uh, that uh, uh, the uh, Smoky Mountain participants are encountering um, as they are working with these data. And so if you find a problem that is very interesting um, that you find in these data, um, that is something that we would entertain and definitely um, rank uh, pretty high. And so again, um, if you have any questions, I will be on the AMA, uh, and you're also free to uh, email me with uh, uh, other questions. Okay, thank you so much, Iona. Um, I'm not seeing any questions in the chat, but there will be time at the end of these. Uh, 
Dasha, I believe you are representing channel challenge seven, Dr. Dasha Hermanova. And I didn't know if you had notes because Dasha is also our data liaison. But each of these challenges have an Oak Ridge National Lab scientist that's a liaison for the challenge. So I'm going to turn it over to Dasha Hermanova. Uh, and I'm moving to challenge seven unless you have something you wanted to do for challenge six first. Uh, I think I'm going to start with the challenge seven and then maybe if there are any questions, I can also help answer them. Um, sorry, I'm not sure if you can see my camera or not. Um, you cannot. You're, you look like a yellow square. That's strange. I'm so sorry. Uh, I'm not sure why my camera isn't working, so I'm just going to turn it off. Um, um, nice to meet everyone. So my name is Dasha Hermanova. Thank you, Suzanne, for the introduction. I'm a research scientist at Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Um, so I'm here to talk about the Challenge 7. So Challenge 7 is um, special. It's a little bit different from the rest of the challenges in that it's actually a challenge that is organized through Kaggle. Um, and it's a challenge which focuses on um, mining information from research literature about um, COVID-19 and other coronaviruses to answer specific pressing questions that scientists are now looking at. But we included this challenge um, to the Smoky Mountain um, data challenges um, set because both if you're interested in, if you think you have an interesting solution and you're interested in finding a publication venue, or if you're interested in finding a venue where you could discuss your solution with other researchers, um, and we wanted to provide a venue for that. And also many re researchers at ORNL are currently working on various different solutions for the coronavirus. So it is also interesting for us to see what people can find out um, and whether they can answer any of these questions. And one more thing I wanted to say is we welcome both complete or even partial solutions to any of the questions that are asked on the challenge website on Kaggle. Um, so if you have anything that you think uh, might be interesting, we're very interested in seeing that. And even like Ioana said in, um, in this case as well, if you find any um, maybe if you have interesting observations that are maybe not directly related to any of the questions that are being asked on the Kaggle website, but are still seem like might be helpful, uh, we're absolutely interested in seeing that. So um, if it's okay, I'm going to take over with my screen share and go over what the chat, sorry, what the data is and what the questions are. Um, so hopefully you can, let's see my entire screen and hopefully you can hopefully you can see my screen um yes we can see yes you. excellent so i'm going to switch to the kaggle website so for the challenge seven um you need to obtain the data from kaggle and um the solutions will also be submitted to kaggle but the paper submission will be done exactly the same way as susan described in the beginning through our easy chair um so when i open the kaggle website um the data can be downloaded from here um, all of the data is served from Kaggle. And so what the data is? So because of the current pandemic, um, something that happened is that a lot of research effort is now being focused on answering many different questions around uh, the coronavirus and not just vaccines and drugs, which is what's being frequently talked about, but there are other questions that people have, like, for example, what social distancing guidelines work best? Um, which have shown um, to really reduce the risk of transmissions, or um, does it make sense for us to wear masks? Um, what is the evidence to support that, for example, how can we protect older people and things like this? Um, and so research on this topic has really ramped up. Um, and so to support researchers who are interested in actually looking at what research is being done, I'm sorry, I'm gonna turn this off, sorry. Um, the White House, together with leading industries in the area, have put together this data set of, I believe now, more than 60,000 research papers that talk about either COVID-19 or other coronaviruses. And they provided them to the public um, for free through this challenge. Um, so it's a very large set. And I think um, the hope is that maybe some of these answers or some of these pressing questions that we have can be found in this data set. Unfortunately, the data set is so large because it's 60,000 papers. It would be great if somebody could read all of that, remember it and connect all the dots in their head and provide these answers, but that's impossible for a single person to do, which is why we are now exploring computational methods to do that. Um, and so that's where this challenge comes from. 
Um, so the data is more than 60,000 papers that are collected from all sorts of databases, including PubMed Central, BioArchive, um, and others. Um, and then together with, I believe, the World Health Organization and with US NASIM, um, these institutes that provided the data set, they put together a set of questions that are some of the most pressing questions around, about the coronavirus. So for example, they include things like, what are, um, what are some promising drugs being just, you know, tested currently? Or other things like, what are the most um, important risk factors that we look at? So things like, um, if I have a pre-existing conditions or a condition, which conditions um, put me at higher risk of having severe complications from the coronavirus? Or if I am a smoker, is that something to consider? Um, so things like this. So it's a broad range of questions um, about all sorts of things, including how the virus spreads, how does it spread between humans and animals, for example, and so on. So like I said, um, some of these questions are quite broad um, and might require several steps to arrive to some kind of an answer. So um, we will come both complete or some partial solutions to these questions, even if you, for example, manage to get through half of it, it's still um, going to be very interesting. Um, and so if you are uh, new to mining um, this data set, if this is the first time you're seeing it and you're maybe a novice and these questions seem challenging, um, I have a list of maybe basic questions that, um, to get you started with exploring the data, um, which is what I have here. So the detailed questions are on the Kaggle website, but for example, some of the initial things that you could look at if you're starting to explore this data is things like, how are the publications distributed according to age? Um, and how many of them come from different sources. This might be important because databases like BioArchive, for example, are typically used to share publication preprints, um, which means they haven't gone through a formal peer review of other scientists looking at them and making sure that the content um, is, is correct, um, which is both really helpful because that means that scientists can share results much, much faster than they traditionally would be able to. But at the same time, it poses some challenges because BioArchive might contain research that hasn't previously been validated by anybody else. Um, so these are all just different things that might come in play when you're looking at the answers. Something else you could look at, for example, is just very simply of all the publications, how many of them even talk about COVID-19 and how many of them talk about other coronaviruses. And um, I believe in the data set, um, abstracts are provided. So something simple you could start at the beginning is, for example, just looking at how many times the COVID-19 keyword appears in any of these titles or abstracts. Um, another thing that we've noticed is, for example, that there are sometimes duplicate publications. Um, so there would be papers that the authors have posted, for example, both on BioArchive or in PubMed Central. And so what are some good ways to identify these so that they are um, removed when we are looking at the answer? And I'm not sure um, if you have ever used Kaggle before, but if you haven't, there is something very helpful on Kaggle, which is both there is a discussion that you can participate in, but there are also um, existing solutions um, can all be viewed here um, under the tab kernels. And it seems like more than 1300 people have already tried to answer some of the questions. So this is something where if you're actually um, trying to get started with the data, you could go to some of these kernels and see some examples for how people have loaded the data and how they have cleaned them and pre-processed them. So I went through some of them, and if you're just getting started, there are three examples that I found to be quite helpful um, that I will share through the chat um, so that you can look at them yourselves. Um, one kernel, which looks at basic data cleaning, so how to remove, for example, stop words and things like this, and how to transform, transform the data into useful tables. A second example that looks at simply how to cluster publications so that um, I can identify maybe sets of publications that are very similar to each other and start looking at do these maybe talk about specific questions that relate um, or sp about specific topics that relate to some of the questions being asked. Um, and then a notebook that goes um, into more detail about some text mining techniques, um, like looking at specific um, engrams and which are most popular through text and things like this. So I will post all of these and if you have any specific questions or any further questions, um, I will also be on the AMA answering questions and I will be happy to help. Um, so I think that's everything for me. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and pass on to you, Suzanne. Okay, very quickly, there's two questions that came up about the challenges. We have one more presenter, Dr. Travis Johnson, and he's our former winner. 
and I do want him to go through and give you some tips, but quickly, there were a couple of pretty, well, I don't know if they're basic, but I think questions that can be answered relatively quickly. So, uh, Junji, this is for challenge two. Uh, sorry, Dr. Junji, are classes evenly distributed or are, or is the class, uh, is class balancing, is it a balancing issue? Um, the class are not equally distributed and one of the challenge of this data set is uh, the number of class, uh, the prevalence of each class is, follows the prevalence of that material in nature. So in nature, some kind of structure, symmetry, lower symmetry, usually have more material follows lower symmetry. So more material, more data point will have belongs to that class. So I hope that answers the question. Okay, and we had a question for challenge six that's about the data. What modality of data does challenge six involve, uh, Iona? answer that so it involves data um but if you um uh, go you can uh, actually go and uh, look at the data by downloading it as suzanne has said um and uh, we also provided some uh, references for example to the uh, clinical trials like api that has a uh, text that uh, uh, has the um, unstructured eligibility criteria so it's like unstructured text from the clinicaltrials.gov or nci clinical trials api so that's another uh, data source in addition to the structured data that we're providing all right um and then there's a question, who owns the solution in the end? Uh, so you'll be publishing these solutions in the conference journal. So your name is attached with them. I cannot tell you who owns it in the case of the Kaggle challenge, but in our challenge, you're we're viewing this as you're an author that's publishing the data. You have to acknowledge ORNL probably in your acknowledgements in some way. Uh, there's probably like a DOE grant just statement that you put at the bottom, but that's it for our challenges. Um, Kaggle, it's different. All right, I do want to, before we get a flood of questions, I want Travis to give you his quick tips for how to tackle these challenges. So Dr. Travis Johnson. Hey, can you hear me? Yes. Cool, cool. So yeah, so I, I, I just wanted to give you a little bit of a, very quickly what happened, what, what, what I did and sort of what I thought was helpful. And, and hopefully you can use some of that, so. So I did the challenge. It was the first year that the challenge happened, and and the problem that I tackled was a problem with neutron diffraction. And uh, the the long story of the, or the the short version of the the challenge was to identify peaks in the data, and be able to measure things about those peaks, like where they happen and how you know how big they are, how much area is under the curve, and then to identify the the big question was to identify like a phase transition in the material from the peak from from observing the peaks change as a sort of you know. Temperature was changing in the background, and you wanted to identify that. And so I, I didn't really have any background uh, with any kind of neutron diffraction stuff. The, the closest um, sort of analogy that I had was you know, I'd done a little bit of work with spectroscopy in the past. And so in my mind, I'm just like, I'm just going to pretend like this is spectroscopy and ignore the fact that it isn't. And, uh, and it, it turned out working pretty well. Um, I was able to, to answer the first couple of questions, like being able to find peaks and measure them. That, that turned out to be fairly easy to do. Um, but the, the big question that they had was, you know, identify this phase transition. And like, I spent a lot of time trying to, trying to answer that. And, and part of the problem was, is like none of the methods that I had were giving like a clear transition. So the, the idea was sort of, you know, like something in your data would dramatically change when, when this phase transition happened. And uh, for me, well, when I was looking at it, you know, nothing was working and there was no like dramatic change. And so um, I, was, I was basically, I was gonna give up and I, I talked to Suzanne and I was just like, you know, like, but I, I, I don't think there is a phase transition or it's at least not very, you know, not very well defined. And, and like, I don't think my, the stuff that I did is pretty simple. Like, I don't think it's worth submitting. And Suzanne encouraged me to, uh, to submit anyway. And turned out that was a good choice. So. I'm glad I listened to her, but uh, and and the other thing that turned out was that um, the the question that they'd asked like where did this transition happen? It was actually sort of the, what I found out later was that there wasn't a a a, a, a phase transition that well there, there anyway 
what they're asking for couldn't be answered because there wasn't like one temperature where it happened, right? So, and I, I suspect that'll probably be similar with some of these data sets. Like they, they may ask questions that can't be answered or some of the questions are gonna be very open-ended. And so it's up to interpretation a, a lot, you know, by the person participating. So um, what, what I wanted to encourage everyone to do, you know, spend some time just playing with the data, you know, do your best and whatever you happen to, you know, learn or achieve, even if it's only, you know, I solved one or two problems really well, but not the other three, like, you know, don't, don't worry about any of that, you know, submit what you have. And uh, simple solutions are often, you know, much better than complex solutions. So don't, don't think that because your solution is very simple that you should discount it. Um, those are, are very helpful. And the other, the other thing that I just, that I, that I really enjoyed was, I, one of the reasons why I picked the challenge is because I just read a data visualization book and I wanted to try to practice some of the techniques that I had read about. And so for me, that was my goal was like, you know, I, I what I want to do is I want to create certain kinds of visualizations. And so I want to you know do this challenge because I think that will help me. So what I would encourage you to do is sort of figure out, you know, what are you hoping to get out of the challenge? Like, do you want to learn a new skill? Do you want to network with the people who are, you know, providing the challenge? You know, like what, what, what's your sort of goal and make sure that the, the problem that you choose will help you to get to that goal and worry more about, you know, like, are you learning the things that you wanted to learn? Then, you know, did I get the, the, the right answer, you know, whatever the right answer might be. And I'll, I'll, I think my email is also on, on the website. Um, so if you have any questions for me, feel free to, to shoot me an email and I, I don't mind giving you some pointers or, you know, I, I haven't gone through this data, so, you know, it's, it's not cheating to, <laughs> to ask like, what would you do? You know, like, I, I'm happy to, to answer questions or just chat about the experience or whatever, so. Okay, thank you, Travis. Um, so, yeah, and one of the things, there is an email that actually goes to all of us. Uh, Travis is a data liaison for challenge um, five, correct? Yeah, I have been in contact with them yet. Yeah. Okay, so the BP challenge. I'm so trying to solve the problems though, so I don't know the, I don't know the answer. But, yeah. <laughs> but there is an email that goes to all of our data liaisons. Each challenge has one, and that is an SMC dash data challenge at ornl.gov. I will post that in the AMA and in the chat. So if you send to that email, we can route the questions to whoever needs to, but we really hope you'll post questions in the AMA because we want everyone to help everyone else solve these challenges. Challenges. So we want you all to learn from each other as they go. Um, there are some questions about the Kaggle challenge that I am not sure how to answer uh, at the current time. So uh, I will have to get back with you on that. These questions about how to participate and how to register and so forth. Um, that's something that we'll have to look into. So we're right at a minute and we can probably have time for one last question. Does anybody have a general question? Um, I see one more for challenge two actually in the chat. There's no, no other challenges. So for challenge two, the classifier for crystallographic space group, they would like to know what the classifier is for the crystallographic space group. That, that's the talent, right? So um, the talent, the question of uh, uh, the, the participant, participant to build a classifier for the crystal graphics group. And uh, one of the issue is that uh, it's unbalanced. So uh, you may do some data augmentation or do some dealing with imbalanced data or do some subgrouping or, or, or recombination, stuff like that. Yeah, that's actually the challenge to build a classifier. Okay, thank you. Everyone else, please uh, post to the AMA your questions. I have uh, copied that into the chat and I'll do that one more time so it's up in everybody's view. You also, if you were, uh, receiving the emails for this meeting, the link should be in those emails. Uh, so hopefully we'll see your questions on the AMA. Thank you so much everyone for participating. Uh, I'm Suzanne peretti Kuhn, and I'm helping chair this year and I really appreciate your attention and your good questions. Thank you so much data sponsors and data liaisons for your excellent presentations. So goodbye everybody. Sherry, you can stop the recording. <laughs>